to really help us become a strong entrepreneurial community. Uh, Sarah has been awesome in facilitating workshops, webinars, uh, digital resources for everyone during COVID. So she is just a wealth, wealth, wealth of knowledge to our community. We are so excited to have her also as a co-founder of Swig Culture, which is our conference uh, where we bring everyone together to educate and facilitate in a more expanded way. Uh, so we are just so excited that Sarah would lend her knowledge today when it comes to staffing. Not only will you be an entrepreneur, but you will also be operating your business. And a part of that will cover staffing talent for your experiences. So Sarah is going to go over that information with us. So everyone have your notepads handy and tune in and welcome and let's clap it up for Sarah. Ah. Guys, I don't know if you can see how red my face is right now, but like, I'm one of those people that like, I will be happy to compliment you, but you compliment me and I'm like, yeah, okay. Uh, that was an amazing introduction. I will have to take a moment to um, let my face drain so that I can uh, cool back down. But one of the first things I want to do is I want to ask you guys to, and I've done this three times already, but some of you guys might be new, some of you guys might just need a constant reminder, and so we're going to get in this habit. So I want you to take your CEO hat, and I want you to put it on your head, all right, because we are employers. We are not entrepreneurial employees, which I think a lot of people uh, tend to get in that mindset, uh, especially if we're new and we're just kind of transitioning from being an employee or working for someone else to being an employer. Even if you were a manager, in your previous position or in your previous life, now you're the employer and it looks different, it feels different, you have more skin in the game. Um, and so it gets real easy to kind of fall back into, well, I'll just do it myself. Um, and th that's okay if that's what you're trying to build. If you're just trying to build something that you can do on the weekends, if you've got a you know, full-time job and you're not really looking to make a life of this or a real you know, um, long-term goal with this, then that's okay. But even in those cases, chances are you're, in a, you're gonna need to staff. So I have two questions for you and you can answer them together apart, but I do wanna see some answers to this. Are you scared to scale your business beyond just a single event a day or enough events where you or your partner can be at all events, okay? That was the first question. Are you scared to scale your business to a place wherein you can't be at every event? All right, I, I already see a bunch of yeses, all right? And so then the next thing that I want you guys to, to tell me is what scares you the most? What is it about not being at every event that scares you? Why is that a mental block for you, okay? Uh, um, yeah, control, um, control, uh, control, right? Okay, so then I wanna ask yourself the, the, this other thing. Um, make a list of all the things that you can control, actually control in any given day, what would that be? Because I think that list will actually be a lot shorter than you think. You can't actually control how your children behave, how people drive on the road. You can't control, you know, the weather. You can't control what's on television, although now you can kind of look things up on the internet. But there's a lot of things that we just kind of walk through the day to day and we can't control. And what happens is that as entrepreneurs, we try and mitigate for that lack of control um, by just doing everything ourselves. And then you really truly can control everything, but then your business is only ever gonna be as big as you are. I mean, let that sit in. Your business, unless you can let go of some of that control is never gonna be any bigger than you are. And you are human, you're fallible, even you'll make mistakes, and you might someday not be able to host an event for whatever reason right? You might uh, get sick. You may get injured. You, you know, may have a family member that requires you to travel, you know, long distance to the sea. You may want to take a vacation. You know what I mean? Um, you can't be your business. Even if, even if you want this to be a super small boutique -y thing that just lives and dies with you, you cannot be your business. It has to be something separate unto yourself, okay? And so, the very best way to grow bigger beyond yourself is to hire people, okay? So we're gonna talk about staffing today. And there are five things 
that I kind of utilize or think about when I think about staffing my own business. Um, one is to clarify, I'll go through each of these, standardize, hire, onboard, hold accountable, and then appreciate, All right? So we're gonna go eat, uh, through each one of these, but I'm gonna read through some of these comments just before I kind of go through. I'm a control freak. Someone will screw up insurance, making sure my brand is on point, uh, control, control. Finding the right talent, uh -huh, we're gonna talk about that. I'm worried about the quality of my brand if I'm not there. Um, not everyone has the same idea of great service as I would and, and not handle a pop-up problem as well. Uh huh. Um, my brand will not be represented. Yeah, okay guys, these are all the uh, totally normal natural things that almost every brand, every owner has ever felt. And if you think back, to like the very first dude who was flipping burgers for McDonald's, right? I'm gonna, and, and this, I'm making this total shit up, but uh, someone had to be the first, right? Chances are he's flipping burgers and people liked it. And at one point he's like, well, geez, I can't do all these burgers myself. I'm gonna have to hire someone. But they were probably really uncomfortable because at that one time they're like, no one can make a burger like me. And they're not necessarily wrong because I truly believe that love is an ingredient in what we do. The cocktail making, you know, the uh, interaction with, with guests and the hosts, um, our social media impact, our love for this is a part of the ingredient. And that is not really replaceable, okay? But lots and lots of what you do is totally, totally replaceable, all right? And I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, a little story too. Um, maybe I'll tell you that in a minute. But so the first thing that I want people to do with their CEO's hat on is after this, there's a little bit more homework for you. I want you to go through and just start writing down all the things that you do, all the things. I mean, this you can do it as micro as, as you want, um, because then what you're going to do is you're going to take, you're basically going to label each one. Um, can it be delegated, automated, eliminated, or treasured? Those are the things, uh, right? And so what you're going to find is that a lot of the things that you actually do can be delegated. You are not the best person to be doing that. You're not the only person who should be doing that or could be doing that, right? So then it, the question becomes, how do I delegate that, right? And then almost everything you do can be broken down into a process, right? It's called setting the expectation. So if you are going to do, uh, if you have to pack, this is one of the first things I outsourced. If I had to pack, I created a list. It was a checklist of everything that needed to be packed. I then organized my stock room and I trained one of my bartenders to pack for me. I would have a clipboard, there'd be a packing list, and then they would just go through and they'd pack. And then after the event, they would do it all in reverse. They would do the dishes, they would put everything back, and then everything would be ready for the next one, right? So not everything that you do is so unique that only you can do it. All right, so the part of the clarifying uh, part of your business is, is, two, is twofold. Who do you want to be, okay? There's a number of you out there that you guys just really wanna be a bartending staffing service and you wanna be able to send bartenders on site. They need to have good bar kits. They need to have a uniform. They need to have a, a checklist um, of what, you know, mixers or whatever they need to pick up with ice on their way there, whatever that might be. And that's what you're looking for, okay? So as long as you standardize those few things, then you can hire pretty and do high volume. Others of you, you want a little bit different, maybe a high touch, right? That requires a little bit more interaction. Maybe there's you know, like you decorate it differently every time or you super customize all the cocktails to each and every single uh, event you do. And if that's the case, then you're not going to be able to out or you're not gonna be able to standardize um, as much as that high volume operation. But it doesn't mean that you can't standardize it, right? And we'll go into a little bit more uh, about that. But it, figure out who you want to be. Do you wanna be high touch? Do you wanna be high volume? Because what you decide you want to be also would determine the type of staff that you want to hire. So for example, when I first got into the mobile bar scene, one of the things that frustrated me the most was that most of the caterers were doing the bartending and the caterers didn't really care much about the bar experience. They would just hire 1099 bartenders. And when I started doing informational interviews, which again is something you'll be required to do as part one, uh, uh, week one of the Power Launch program, I started doing inter informational interviews with venues and um, event planners and asking them, 
what are some of your pain points with working with mobile bar companies? And some people uh, really worried about, well, they, they tend to drink while they're at the event. And that, you know, doesn't really give me a ton of uh, confidence. Sometimes they arrive smelling like smoke, um, which, you know, isn't really a, a, a great uh, experience for the guests or the, um, the couple that, that hired them either. They don't, necessarily clean up their space um, before they leave. And so it's sometimes a little bit of a mess. And all of those pain points helped me create who I wanted to be as a bar company and then hire who I wanted to be as a bar company, right? And so if you're not, uh, if you're not clear about who you want to be to the industry, you're going to have a hard time finding people who fit your culture. So clarifying who you are is the first step. Who do you want to be? All right. That will depend. That will depend on who you actually hire. The second thing is to, to after you've, you know, written out all the things that you do, standardize the things that can be standardized. Okay. Um, bar kits is a great example for this. I figured out exactly what I wanted in every bar kit. So if you hired one of my bartenders, a bar kit came with it. Shaker, spoon, bar mat, uh, jigger, uh, garnish tray, garnish tongs, cutting board, knife, small garbage can, three uh, garbage bags, three bar towels. I had to the T what would be in every single one of my uh, bar kits. And then I'm able to just say, okay, I need you to go pack four bar kits for the weekend to, you know, the person that I had uh, working on my prep and my cleanup, okay? So standardizing things is the second thing. And you can go all on and on about the standardization. You just kind of keep working down uh, until you suddenly wake up and you're like, oh, I don't even do any of this anymore. Any questions about standardizing? Let's see, I'm gonna pause for a second here. <laughs> okay. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions so far on standardizing. Uh, tomorrow, you can just start anywhere, but just know that we still have higher on board, hold accountable and appreciate coming. So if you think any of them are going to be in there, you can wait. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the hiring process, because the best part, the best way, actually, I'm going to hop off that because something just, um, I had an intuitive hit that you guys uh, need to hear this. Um, so, uh, it goes. I got so excited about it um, that I, okay, so we're going to move on to hiring. Uh, you're going to want to hire great people, but first you need to vet them. And so what I like to do is I like to put them through a rather extensive process because I want the people that come out the bottom of my funnel, my hiring funnel, to be fantastic. Um, okay, so the first thing that I'll do is I'll create an awesome job description. Okay, the job description is everything because in that job des description, I want to vet them for culture. I want them to resonate with my voice. I don't necessarily, I'm not kind of just standard everyday, you know, corporation and neither are you. So I'm not going to go on like um, indeed.com and copy a, uh, you know, Red Robin bartender uh, job description and use that because I'm not corporate. I'm not Red Robin. So I'm going to write it myself. I'm going to tell them who we are, what we do. And then I'm going to ask them, or basically going to say who we're seeking, right? One of the things I seek is people who have experience in high volume bartending. Another thing I seek is previous managerial experience. I don't necessarily need them to have ever worked events before, but if they have it, that's preferred. I need them to um, have worked some sort of formal um beverage uh, or restaurant capacity. Um, sometimes restaurants will do uh, bartender servers, depending on which uh, the background they are. So, I mean, some people have, a, if you're a really decent s server who also has t bartended a little, I can probably, if I, I, I can teach you skill a whole lot better than I can teach you culture, okay? So remember that um, you wanna hire for culture first and foremost, um, because you can hire for skill or if you hire for skill, you can't teach the culture portion of that, right? And so the first thing that I do is I start with a really great job description. A job description that you're gonna read and you're gonna know, ooh, I'd like to work with her, or no, I don't really resonate with that, right? Then they send me their resume, I'm very clear about what I want. I want a resume, brief introduction, right? Um, and then when I look over to see if they can actually demonstrate they've had high volume experience and they can check off all that, yeah, I have this experience. 
And it's important to, to include that because here's the thing, even if you W-2, and we can talk about that in a second, but even if you W-2 everybody and they're actually employees, you probably don't have 40 hours a week for them. You probably aren't getting enough of their time to actually go through like a restaurant would and train them up. So when bartending schools call me and say, hey, we've got a bunch of new uh, grads, would you be interested? No. I wouldn't because I that's not I don't have enough time to actually raise up a baby bartender. I need to hire for skill, I need to hire for experience. And so I'm looking for that on the resume. If the resume looks good, then I make them do an exercise. And I don't mean like sit-ups, although that would be funny. I send them a response wherein I require them to think critically because as everyone here knows, when you're working events, you oftentimes don't get the chance to go ask a manager. Sometimes, even if I'm there, they may be at a bar all the way across the way. And if there was something that happened, I may not be, I may be in the, the weeds because we just got, you know, 50 people in the, you know, whatever. And so I need them to be able to think critically. Okay, so I'm gonna ask questions in that little exercise that are gonna demonstrate to me that they can solve problems. I also want to ask them something that can demonstrate that they can think critically about a situation they're not currently in. And there's a book, and I can't remember it, Paul, I know you're probably uh, going to follow up and ask me this question, so I'll try and remember. There's a book that um, actually talks about the most successful pilots, and you know other, but they had this uh, about pilots. Um, and I think they made the movie, it was with uh, Tom Hanks and there was the airplane that's like going over New York and how he ended up landing that plane in a way that like nobody else could. And so they went back and they studied like his process to figure out how he um, who could do that in a plane that had never been flown manually like that. And people would recount flying with him as kind of a pain in the ass because he would basically make them um, do exercises like the co-pilots would do exercises on the way there trying to um say well if this happens what would you do and the the younger airplane uh pilots were kind of like well i'll just let autopilot do it right and he's like no like we don't have autopilot what would you do and so he was really forced to critically think and so what happened with that dude is because he always played these games in his head what would you do if what would you do if that when this actually happened in real life he's like oh got this right? And so you want to demonstrate or you want to make them demonstrate they can do the same thing. And granted, it's not in like, you know, everyone's going to die if you don't get this right. Thank God. I always say we're not in the business of saving lives and I'm grateful for that. Um, however, I do want to know that if you show up and something is missing or if you show up and there's a new menu you've never had before that you can think really like on your feet, right? So this is, I, you know, I, one of the ones that I, I always ask is, you come into an event, mojitos are on the menu. What do you do in your two hours of setup time to set yourself up for success? Now, what this one question tells me is how good they are as a bartender, right? Because there's a lot about a mojito that you can do the, the right way, the wrong way, right? And I don't even care if it's technically possible. Sometimes people will be like, well, to save myself a step, I'll make a mint simple syrup so I don't have to muddle mint for you know all of these people. I love that. I love that, the thought and the sentiment of it. Would we actually be able to make a mint, mint simple syrup on site at the event last minute? Probably not, but I liked the critical thinking, right? Um, and, and people will solve that any, for every person I've asked that question, they've solved it, solved it slightly differently. Some people solved it completely wrong. Um, like they just didn't put any effort into it, right? There was no thought about the actual process. And if they can't actually break down the actual process of like, well, I would first put all the beer in the ice or, you know, whatever, then they're not going to be able to do it in real time either, right? The people you want, especially for events, are the people that are thinking two or three steps ahead inherently, which is one of the reasons why I look for managerial experience. Because if anybody has ever been for any good amount of time, especially in the restaurant industry, a bar manager or a floor manager or an assistant manager, they have always, especially in restaurants, because you never know what shit show you're walking into any given day, having to think a couple steps ahead. All right. And so I look for that in my bartenders because I don't have time for the newbies and chances are you don't either, not as long as we are, you know, getting started and getting ramped and we don't really have full schedules. So the first thing I do obviously is the great job description. The second thing I do is the, um, the, uh, 
board problem, basically. You know, tell me who you are, demonstrate that you can do problem solving. The third thing I do is I have a call with them. Now, this call isn't really going to be long. I'm really looking for a few things. I'm looking to see how they show up. I am um, an employer or a potential employer, and I just want to see how is it to interact with them? Are they constantly cutting me off? Are they talking over me? Are they listening? Um, are they pleasant? How do they address me, right? Because a lot of times our bartenders are gonna be the first people that people see. And so if the mother of the bride comes up to the bar and someone you know, is like, what you want? No, no, that's not gonna fly for me, right? Like that's just not my brand. And so I, I'm able to kind of test for that on a phone call where I get to talk to them. And I kind of tell them a little bit more about me because I want to set that, ex that expectation where I'm like, hey, I'm a lifelong veteran of the restaurant industry. I have a master's degree in hospitality. Uh, this is my baby you know, brainchild that my husband and I started from scratch four years ago. Um, you know, I tell them a little bit about our origin story because here's why. People either resonate with me, and I'm going to say that, keep saying that, they either resonate with me or they don't. And the people who get through that call by the end of it, they are either really, really excited to work with me, or they're kind of like, ah, uh, yeah, this doesn't seem like it's going to fit, right? And so I'll tell them a little bit about like how I pay, you know, I pay shift pay. It's not hourly, but I want to make sure that you guys are walking away with at least X number of dollars, tips on top of that, right? And so I give them a little bit of a taste about who I am, uh, what Bar Magnolia is and uh, what success looks like from this position, um, whether it's a bartender or bar manager, whatever else that looks like. If at the end of that call, and I usually ask them, so what are you thinking? Is this something you'd wanna, you know, it sounds exciting to you? If they're like, yes, absolutely. Um, then the next thing is actually, I call it the, uh, we, we call, um, we meet, and so they, I usually invite them over to the, um, when I had the warehouse, it was the warehouse. And when I was at the, um, the house that I would invite them over to the house uh, and we get a face-to-face. -face. I get to show them like, here's the bars, um, you know, what other questions do you have? But this is just one more step of vetting. So I can make sure that, you know, uh, we have the opportunity to talk and to meet because culture fit again is so, so important. And we're not full-time employers with an office where people can come and sit down and like have meetings and everything. And so the more face-to-face -face time I can get with someone, even though I don't want to take up a ton of their time because it's just a hiring process for a little tiny little bartending company, I need to know that they are a good fit, right? So if I can gauge good culture fit by the uh, in-person meeting, I will invite them to pick up a shift that I'm on. And then this is a total, like I will pay them for this. It's almost like the, you know, the uh, dress rehearsal or whatever, um, but, th but they play bar back. They don't um, necessarily tend the bar unless, you know, for whatever reason uh, it becomes a necessity, but they really just play bar back and they see how we work. They see how we set up, you know, I get to see them on their feet, right? Um, I was just uh, to prep for this. I actually watched the staffing workshop that I did, it's it's already located, I think it's located, maybe I could, yeah, I think it's located in the resource section of mobile Bev pros, but you'll have to scroll back quite a ways because it's, uh, it's a pretty uh, older uh, video. But I was telling a story about how I had hired this dude, um, great interviewer, had spent a lot of times working the bars on Broadway, um, which is super high volume. He was a football player and like 6'3", so super strong, which of course me having to haul around all these bars, I was like, that's awesome. Um, and so I have him show up to this wedding and uh, it was his first shift and he was just kind of doing bar back. And so he was helping me move the bar, which I was like, again, excited about because it was an indoor bar. Um, and he's like, oh, I can't lift because I, I actually had um, surgery from playing football, you know, like six months ago and I'm still recovering. He's like, I can't really lift. I was like, oh, okay, no problem. Um, um, I was like, well, darn, I guess I'll be learning this myself. And then uh, we go to actually get behind the bars. And, and this is painful for me because I had kegged the mixers. There were two cocktails. And so literally I had kegged the mixers. So you just had to add an ounce and a half of alcohol. None of them were um, shaken cocktails. It was an ounce and a half of alcohol. And then you topped with mixer um, and you stirred it and you handed it. And he asked me for the recipe three times. And a part of me just died inside because I was like, he did great on the written, he did great on the phone, he did great in the uh, the call or the in-person meeting that we had. Um, but when it came down to actually executing, not so great. And I would never have known that 
had I not done um, that that stage, that kind of what they call them a stage in the restaurant industry, but it's basically like, let me see you work, let me see you in action, right? Um, and so that those th four components are my magic formula for hiring um, good staff. After you get the first good base uh, staff in, what I've also found is I never need to post another job ad again. Because if you get a good number of people, like the first few hires that you have are like super solid, really good um, staff members, they will tell their friends and their friends will wanna work with you and they will only wanna work with great friends. And so what I found is that that flywheel was that first few, uh, you know, job description um, bartenders that I hired just continued to populate my entire resume or my entire roster with friends and people that um, they they loved working with and they wanted to work with because nobody wants to spend six hours working behind a bar with someone they don't like, right? They're going to invite the people that they know will do equal work and that they really enjoy the conversation with. And that's also another big part, I think, of the uh, stage is that um, you know real quick as to whether or not you can spend a lot of time behind the bar with someone. If you're back there for six hours and you're just asking them kind of questions and uh, they're like not really jiving with you, chances are they're not a good culture fit. And so it's not really gonna um, work out very well. So that's kind of the hiring process from like finding the good people. The next part of that process is actually gonna be the more formal part of onboarding that person. But I'm gonna take a break and see if there are any questions. Andrea, were there any questions from that? section? Yes. So first question was, how do I transition from being the face of the business? You do not have to. You do not have to transition from being the face of the business. What you can, what you can do is you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a CEO of a, of a company not a bartender that's gonna sling drinks at everyone's wedding. And so if you've set the expectation that you will be at every wedding, then you don't need to not be the face. You can just say, you know, like, hey, I'm the business owner and uh, I can't be at all weddings. I can't be at all events, but I can guarantee you that my staff is gonna take really good care of you. Okay, question number two, are the critical thinking questions done via questionnaire or in-person interview? Um, you can do it either way, but I like to do it via email. One, because um, I'm going to have a call with them and I'm gonna have an in-person meeting with them anyways. And so I would like to give the critical thinking skills just via uh, email, because if they come back with shit answers, I don't wanna waste my time meeting with them. Okay, uh, final question. I'm actually gonna combine the two because they fall into the same. Um, how do you manage working with bartenders that have their own bartending business if you need extra hands on deck? Do you make bartenders sign any legal documents such as NDAs? Well, I can tell you an NDA wouldn't be worth shit here in Tennessee. Even if you signed it, it wouldn't really be uphold. But also, here's the thing. I spent my life in the restaurant industry. How many times do you know, if you've been in the industry, um, the sous chef goes and starts his own restaurant? And then the chef is like, ah, I taught him everything he knows. It's like, that's, a, that's just part of being in the industry. You're basically your own, you know, contractor. If you're in the industry, you can't keep a bartender just because, you know, like you trained that bartender how to, how to attend bar, they could go and get a job anywhere that pays. Right. And so for me, I'm not going to make them send, sign an NDA. If they, most, most, most importantly for me and my model I have actually hired someone who then did start her own mobile bar. And, you know, I very fully support her. It's freaking hard. And so if she decided that she wanted to come and be a competitor of mine, good luck to you because there's, you know, it's hard work. You know, this it's not as easy as just handing out a business card and starting to, you know, a lot of those people that are just like, yeah, I'm going to take their business. They're going to work for 35, $40 an hour. Okay. I didn't want that work anyways, because I charge 50 bucks minimum just for my bartender to arrive on site. So the business they're going to take from me wasn't even my business. I didn't want that business anyways. If that makes sense. I can't hear you, Andrea. You're on mute. So when an employee or a prospective hire is staging for you, do you pay them in cash or do you take them through the traditional W-2 process? Yeah. So if they're staging, I will not onboard them first. 
Um, if they're staging, I'll just pay them cash. They'll be, a t you know, I would, I would make them probably uh, a 1099 um, if I ended up hiring them. But it, it, the federal government doesn't require you to do a 1099 for anything under $600. So um, I would have to probably do a 1099 for the, that one shift. Um, and then, and, and I say probably, because here's another thing. I onboarded all of my employees as W-2s um, in uh, February of 2020. And so I haven't done any hiring since that. So if I was to do it now, I would, uh, I would have to 1099 them for the, for the stage um, if I hired them. And I just wanted to add really quickly about NDAs. Um, I've probably dealt more with NDAs and bartending than Sarah or Rhonda. When I've done brand activations, them being a different level of client, they may ask for a level of NDA from talent. Um, that's really the only time that I've seen NDAs that were, you know, clients that really push for it. If it's, you know, a corporate client or someone's having an exclusive experience, then uh, that's the time when an NDA may be enacted. Yeah, that's a good point. I know that I had some bartenders that worked for me as well as another mobile bar here in the, um, the city. And uh, I think they wanted them to sign an NDA because they thought like trade secrets or something. But for the most part, come on, it's bartending. There are no trade secrets when you're just kind of like slinging drinks on the weekend, right? So I wouldn't worry too much about the legality of that. Um, also, I don't tend to hire a bunch of people that are full-time bartenders. I like people who have real jobs because I probably can't give a roster of 15 people full-time status. So I will hire people that have varying availability. So I, I make sure that I usually have a few people on my roster that work, you know, the nine to fives during the, the week. So they're available on the weekends. But then I also want to make sure that I have a few people on my roster that usually work over the weekends, like maybe they're hairstylists or they get more of their, you know, business that, that time. And then they have their week evenings um, free because that's when corporate events are, are going to be. Um, okay. Liquid Courage, I see that. Uh, caught two bartenders handing out their cards at my event that I was present at. How would you handle? Okay, so um, I handle this very, I, okay. <laughs> my favorite phrase, set expectations, okay? So, so far I've talked to you guys through um, clarifying, standardizing and hiring, but not onboarding. And I'll get to that. But onboarding essentially is when you set the expectation with how people are going to be expected to operate within your sphere and for your brand. Okay. So if you don't want people handing out business cards um, for their own uh, bar, then you need to make sure that you, you tell them that in your contractor's handbook, which you should have because that is going to be their Bible as to how to succeed with you. And if you're not giving them any guidance and you're just expecting them to show up and know how to function successfully within your brand, you're not setting them up for success, right? Then no one's, a, no one's a mind reader. And what might have been acceptable for the other person they work for may not be acceptable for you. So when you're, um, when you're onboarding, I highly recommend a contractor's um, handbook. I'm actually gonna provide you guys with a template for a contractor's handbook as a part of this. And you want to go through it um, because you guys are perfectly capable of reading. Um, but essentially what you're going to want to do is you're going to tell them your origin story, right? So that they, when people come up and ask, and I, I swear to you, every event I'm at, they will always come up to my lead bartender. Her name is Laurel. She's a doll. She's super tall and very attractive. So I'm sure it's kind of like one of those things where they're just like, hey, um, I need something to talk to you about. But she'll be like, or they'll, they'll ask her like, so is this, uh, is this your company? Is this like, uh, do you guys do this everywhere? Or is like, do you, do you have a brick and mortar location, right? All these questions. And she doesn't have to be like, oh, uh, you know, she owns the place, and, you know, because she can be like, oh, well actually Bar Magnolia started this way. And like, she knows my story. Um, and so, sorry, I think Andrea is popping up. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Um, so she knows my story. She knows more about me so that she, she can just point to me like, that's the owner, but here's the story about Bar Magnolia. So your origin story should be in there. 
Your expectations for them should be in here, in there. What does scheduling look like? How are they supposed to pick up shifts? What does payment look like, right? You know, like what, are you gonna pay them every two weeks? Are you gonna pay them at the end of the shift? You know, let them know um, what to expect. What are the uniform situation? Do you have one uniform or do you have options? I have options, right? I have a, a, a white shirt, I have a, a blue checker shirt and I have a black shirt and I require dark denim jeans. I require black jeans or black uh, pants. Um, black shoes, you know, line all of that out. What does it look like if they need to reschedule or release a shift, right? That needs to be in there too. Um, you know, if they get injured, what's the policy for that? Are you carrying workers comp? You know, um, that should be in there too. Think about the things that you would need if you were to show up working for somebody that needed to be documented. I recommend doing this digitally. Um, I know that uh, we've talked about ADP and there's a few others I think out there. Um, or even just Google Drive. But that way, anytime you make a change, you can send it out to everybody because, um, and then let them know where the highlighted change is. That way they know where to look. But the point is, is that you wanna standardize policies as though you were an employer because you are, right? A lot of times we get started because we're really great bartenders and we think that we can just, you know, do that and we can. But the minute you create that LLC or that S Corp or whatever it is that you decide to form your business as, you're now a business owner and people are responsible. Um, you are responsible for people. So uh, Contractor's Handbook is a really great place to actually outline whether or not you'd be cool with them handing out their uh, business cards. Here's another one. Make them their own business cards. If you become a lead for me, you get your own business cards because I want them to feel invested in the uh, the business. I want them to say, "I'm on, you know, I'm a member of Bar Magnolia's team, and here's my bar, uh, my card." And then, if you're really feeling awesome, let them empower them to be your sales team and basically say, "Hey, if you ever refer anybody and we book them, like I'll give you a piece of that." Because you want them to have you on the top of their mind whenever they're out there doing their bartending gig, right? Because I'll tell you, as a bartender, I used to get asked people like, "Hey, we're getting married. Do you guys know have any bartenders?" And not everyone's set up to do that. You know, at that time, I certainly didn't have a team. I couldn't single-handedly bartend a wedding for, you know, 200 people at that time. Um, but those bartenders say you know, can say like, oh yeah, I work for this really great, you know, uh, mobile bartending company. It's Bar Magnolia. Here's my card, right? Um, so think of your team as your sales team. Think of them as your ambassadors because they are. Uh, one of the best ambassadors I have is actually Rhonda and she's got her own mobile bartending company. So, you know, it's really important, I think, to, um, to make sure that the people in your team feel like they're a part of your team and having that um, contractor's handbook, setting those expectations, letting them know how to succeed with in them um, is really important. And also I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of surprised because I feel like with, um, with my team, um, they would not just because I do so much vetting and so much culture fit, I don't think they would ever, ever want to steal a spotlight from me. Um, and, and, you know, even the, even the woman who started her own bar company, you know, she, she never was, you know, she didn't take my client list. She never kind of handed out cards or anything. And so, um, I think culture fit, I think is uh, again, another thing to screen for. Okay. Uh, there, was another, there was another question. I'm sorry about shift oh, no, pay no. versus hourly pay. What was the question? Do I, which do I prefer? It, yes. I prefer shift pay. I like shift pay because people know exactly the minimum that they're going to make. And if they get tips, awesome. And if they don't get great tips, because you never know with events, it's not like, and maybe this is different for everyone, but for me, I might do one wedding and they'll each make $200 in tips. And I might do another wedding and everyone makes $40 in tips. And so it's really hard. And I'm one of those people that like, when they talk about like, should tips be eradicated in restaurants and bars? Uh, my response is, yeah. Because as an employer, I want to make sure that my people are taken care of financially. I don't want to have to have them worry about uh, making making money in, in one of my shifts. So I like shift pay. Um, but you can obviously do hourly. Are there any other questions? Does shift pay include uh, travel? I was going to say, we'll hold questions until you finish the rest of your content and we'll pick back up. Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, hopefully it's not as loud for you as it is for me. Um, okay, so a part of, another part of onboarding for me is I'll do periodic um, team meetings. 
And that's a really good opportunity for them to see and meet each other. Now, I don't make these mandatory because oftentimes you never know like when someone might be available. Um, but I do offer them, you know, quarterly so that people can at least hit one every, every uh, few um, months. But the point of that, I usually have cocktails and pizza and we just have a, a tea meeting and talk about things and some really great conversations and questions come up that I wouldn't necessarily have thought about that then go into my contractor's handbook if it feels like an appropriate thing to do. One example um, was if someone comes to the bar and they're pregnant, should I serve them, right? Like, that's actually something that I think is a good conversation to have. And it really depends on the state. So for example, when I worked in New York and DC, if a pregnant woman comes up to the bar and orders a drink, you have to give them that drink. Like you are not, you know, what if they're not pregnant? Even if they are, it's none of your business, right? But in some states, that isn't illegal to, to refuse. And so that might be a conversation worth having because it really comes down to what would you as the owner want them to say and do if it's not illegal? Um, like, is that something that, cause it's your brand, whatever they do, however, you know, people may, are made to be feel um, represents on your brand. And so you should have a policy around it. You also, the, some questions that have come up that are really good to talk about are, you know, carding, for example, like, do I card everybody? Do I card nobody? Well, you know what, if you're using independent contractors, then it's really up to them because they're the ones that would be held liable in the case of over-serving. If they're independent contractors, they are not covered by your liquor liability insurance. And so they need to be the ones to be providing that coverage, but then they're responsible for their actions. And so that's a good conversation to have. Be like, well, what do you think? Right? Because the answer in that case is if you are unsure about their age, even if someone else has already carded them, you need to card them again because you need to be confident that you're serving someone that's of age, right? Now, do you want to serve, do you want to card everybody and their grandfather? Again, that's up to you. Would I recommend carding someone who's clearly in their 50s or 60s? No, I would not. I wouldn't even recommend carding someone who's clearly in their 40s. But if you are uncomfortable with your ability to gauge age, then the answer to them should always be you do what you feel comfortable doing because ultimately it's your it's your call on that case um so i think those team meetings are really helpful because you don't know what other people know and you don't know what they don't know you don't know how they're going to sell um necessarily solve problems in all those situations and so those team meetings really enable you to have some really good discussions um okay let's see uh, contractors handbook, peer grant team meet meetings, onboarding. I already talked about uh, a lot of these things in the in the context of the onboard or the contractors handbook. But you really should know, you know, when you decide to hire someone, what's your next step? You know, you send them a W nine. Do you send them like onboarding paperwork? You can do these through the, a lot of these online uh, organizations like ADP, so that it's kind of automated. You just you know put in their um, uh, their information, and they get like an email, and they can sign in. Uh, sign in and create all their onboarding documentation. Um, like, how are you going to pay them, right? Are you going to Venmo them at the end of every shift? That's what I did for my first year. Uh, kind of a pain in the ass come tax time for me to track all that. Um, now I use Square um, because again, I W2'd all of, all of my, um, my bartenders. Um, and so the onboarding process really is the, um, the way that you kind of bring them under the fold of your umbrella. So, you know, you are now a team member of Bar Magnolia. This is what this looks like. This is how you succeed here. This is um, how we function within the realm of this organization. The second thing, or the second to last thing, is to hold accountable. This is a super, super important one. If you've never managed a team before, this might be hard, but you're gonna put your big, big girl boy panties on and we're gonna talk about holding people accountable because we talked in the very beginning about how a lot of you um, were resistant to uh, hiring out because of lack of control. And I then pointed out, you have control in very little uh, about this world and holding control over this is, or your, your business so that the business is only as big as you are is not gonna you know, do your business any justice. But the, the long and the short of it is it's not, and actually I think it was Don from HD Food Catering that um, dropped this gem and it might even be in the podcast uh, that we recorded together. But he basically was like, I'm not in the business of uh, pro providing perfect service. No one is. Eventually there will be mistakes, even by you. It's be in the business of the best recovery. Be in the business that you know, no matter what goes wrong, they will be taken care of and you will make it right. And that is the magic because every 
business out there is going to have a bad event. I've had a bad event. I've had a couple bad events. Was it because I didn't know what I was doing? No, there are varying uh, instances, one of which was I didn't have proper information on the front end. So I then went back and changed my, my uh, status to, or my questionnaire to make sure I get that information up front. We're always learning, always growing, but recovery is what matters. And so as long as you can put yourself in the mindset of, you know what, I'm not in business to be perfect. I'm not in business to make sure that every single event goes off without a hitch. I'm in business to make sure that if something does go wrong, I will make it right. All right. And so if that is the change in mindset that you have, then you can go back through and be like, I'm going to hire the right people. I'm going to have the right processes. I'm going to do what I need to make sure that people are set up for success on the front end. I'm going to standardize the things that I can standardize. I'm going to set best practices for the things that maybe have variables right? So you can actually work backwards and from a different mindset, then nothing can go wrong at any of my events because there isn't a certain per single, single company out there that hasn't been around for longer than six months that hasn't made mistakes and had to rebound on that, right? And I know some mistakes from companies, they were major mistakes, but you don't hear about them because they rebound. They rebound in a way that made everybody feel good about it, all right? So the other part about that in the rebound is accountability for your staff. And they need to know that you are going to bring to them feedback and you need to be comfortable providing feedback in a way that is constructive and unemotional. All right. So if that means that something happens and you get this call from a pissed off client and one of your lead bartenders like really shit the bed, you are not going to turn around and call that person immediately. You're not because you're emotional. You need to be unemotional because what needs to happen is you need to provide feedback in a way that is constructive, all right? And you can't do that when you're all emotional. And I know that people struggle with this um, because a lot of you are, will be employers for the very first time and you haven't built up this muscle, all right? And so you remind yourself, my goal is that they are set up to succeed. If something went wrong, then some, that they, they didn't succeed. I need to figure out why they didn't succeed. One, to either adjust behavior, adjust expectations, or adjust, adjust what I'm doing in order to set them up for success, right? And so those conversations in every uh, team meeting I have, every quarter, I remind people, I was like, look, I'm not asking anyone to be perfect, but I am asking you to all be adults. And you guys are out there and, you know, as ambassadors to my company and for my company. And I love that you guys are on my team and you guys are an extension of me. And so if we're going to get better, if we're going to, you know, remain at the level we are, we need to be willing to have hard conversations about hard things. And sometimes you fuck up, sometimes I fuck up. And the, the important part there is that we are communicating together about how I can serve you better and how you can serve the company better. And that that is the standard that we hold. Not that I expect you to be perfect, but that when you aren't perfect, we can have a conversation about it without, you know, getting all emotional and crazy about it. Right. But you do need to set the expectation that you will hold people accountable. Right. What does it look like if someone uh, drops a shift and doesn't get it re like replaced themselves? Some people, you know, uh, mobile bar owners are like, you don't need to get your own replacement. You just tell me if you can't make a shift and I'll find a replacement. Okay, that's not me because I hire adults. So if you pick up a shift for me, you better be there unless you have found someone else to work that shift. Now, if you've tried to find somebody and you absolutely can't be there and you can't find you know, uh, someone to get there for you, then I can take over. But because you're an adult and I've hired you, I wanna make sure that you do the adult thing first and then bring me into it, right? But that's because I have that relationship. I've set that expectation with them that that's how that, that how that's how that works. And so as, as the CEO, you get to pick um, how you want the, those things to show up, but you have to let them know how to operate successfully um, within that. And then the, uh, the downside of accountability is that sometimes you have to part ways, all right? And so I'm gonna do you a favor and I'm going to uh, give you the little trick that has worked for me. I've done a lot of hiring and firing, unfortunately in my days, if I, find, if I find that I have to fire or let someone go, it is literally always because they are not succeeding within the realm that they're in or within the job description that they're in. It doesn't mean that they're a failure and it doesn't mean that they can't uh, be really, really great about something else or even really, really great at the thing they're doing for someone else. It just isn't the right fit right here, right now 
uh, together. And I don't ever want that to be personal. And it's not a, it's not you, it's me conversation. It's, Hey, look, we've had, you know, X, Y, and Z happen. Um, this is how, you know, you've responded. I've responded, whatever that looks like. And it's just clear to me that at this point, um, that you are not able to fulfill the role that I need in this instance. Um, and that is not a poor reflection on you. It just means that I think you'd be better set up for success in another position. Right. And it doesn't have to feel yucky. It doesn't have to be a, a big emotional outburst. In most cases, these bartenders aren't really working with you for a ton anyways. And so it's not really a big deal. It's not like you're their, you're their sole source of income. But the, the overall goal is to say it's not personal. It's strictly professional. Our business has certain needs. You're not meeting them. And so we're just going to need to find someone else who can. Now, if you're a 1099 situation, you can literally just take them off the roster and then they don't get any shifts. But that's not really how I like to show up. I like to make sure that we, you know I already, I'm always setting expectations and holding people accountable. And then I'm transparent and it's all you know a very high integrity process. Um, and so that's the downside of hiring is that sometimes you have to fire, but it never has to feel the yucky. Um, and then the last part before I take questions, it's really to appreciate. Um, appreciate and reward because you really want your bartenders, your staff members to feel like a part of your family. You want them to be invested. And so the best way to do that is just remind them how important they are to you, right? They literally are allowing you to live out your dreams of building this business, a profitable and successful business. So let them know that you appreciate that. Listen when they have something to say, take their feedback when they're providing it about something that didn't go well, or if they're like, this would really help me succeed. Then you know, honor them for being like, thank you for trusting me with that information. I will, you know, try and do what I can. Ask them for their opinions, right? You know, I ask my uh, bartenders like, hey, every year we do a different color t-shirt. and We've done this color and this color. What, what shirt color do you want to have next? Because I really don't care as long as it's one of my brand colors. And I've got like seven brand colors so they can pick, right? Um, and so just engaging them and keeping them uh involved in the business allows them to feel part ownership, which then enables them or will create more um, responsibility. They'll feel like they have a greater attachment to uh, the positive outcomes of the business. I mean, here we are, you know, a year into the pandemic and I still have my bartenders like sharing stuff for me and, you know, hyping us up. One, they probably want shifts, um, but also that, you know, they just really truly love the little business that my husband and I have built. And so, um, you know, that, that to me is the culture I hired for. It's the culture I nurture um, in the people that I hire. Thank you so much, Sarah, for all of your wealth of knowledge. Thank you. If you did not catch some gems in that conversation, you can catch the playback when you receive this webinar. But Sarah, we do have two questions for you from the chat. Yeah. So one question being, uh, when you have staff that travels, uh, one operator was saying they may have bartenders that have to travel for two hours is that included in their shift pay? I don't consider that shift pay, but I do pay for travel. Okay. So, and, and you can do, there is a federal guideline there. So you, that could be your minimum. Um, but I will oftentimes, if there's a travel fee involved, um, I, I basically include in my shift pay what I would include in. So like, it's assumed that they would have to be willing to travel at least 15 miles as a part of their shift pay just like you'd have to like drive to work right like that's included in their shift pay but if it's outside of that radius then there is a you know a per mile that they'll also get or sometimes I'll just be like 25 bucks for travel because it's easy okay and then there was another question about the opportunities for either bar or event companies working with mobile bars in a staff Fair. capacity uh, so using event companies or staffing companies for your mobile bar? Or will, do you foresee that those entities will be looking to mobile bars for staffing or other event services? Um, they could, I, I actually probably see it a little bit to the reverse. So I've seen some mobile bar companies that they buy the rig, they renovate the rig, but then they aren't really um, wanting to sling drinks and that's not really their strong suit. And so what they'll do is they'll partner with local bar tending companies 
um, that don't have rigs or a staffing company that has bartenders that don't have rigs and then utilize them for staffing instead of um, instead of the 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 reverse. Now, if one of my bartenders came or if someone came to me and was like, hey, do you want to staff for my uh, bar staffing company, I would probably just tell my bartending bartenders to, to sign up with them directly if they were interested. Um, because that to me would just be more of like a, you're, you're an independent agent, um, type thing. So go ahead and, you know, if you want to pick up shifts with this bar company, you're welcome to. This is a really good question. When you're first starting out, what do you think about hiring friends and family as contractors? to staff your business? I can't tell you how many people I have had on coaching calls that use friends and family for staffing and have a real hard time with that. Um, one, because there's uh, automatically a weird power dynamic there because they're your friends. And so they don't really want you to tell them what to do. And even if they uh, are you know, really wanting you to succeed and um, my, my, my sister's my biggest um advocate. She talks me up all the time. She's been in the restaurant industry. She, you know, she's uh, been an event planner. I put her on one event because I wasn't able to be there. And, uh, that was literally the only event that year that had a complaint. And I tried to talk to her about it. And it was just like, she was just so emotional about it. And she's like, I'm not your employee. I was doing you a favor. And I'm like, hey, don't like, I know the bride is crazy because there's four other things that she had a problem with that like weren't even us. She was like complaining about the caterer, uh, but she's bringing that to me, right? So I know she's crazy. So working with friends and family can be really, really tricky. Now, if you're paying them out, um, I mean, it's up to you. This is a business decision as to how you want to do it. You can do it as contractors. Um, but again, we've talked about this um, in other, I've, again, this is the thing where I think I've said it like a million times, but there's still people who haven't heard it. Um, if you're doing them as contractors and something happens and it's your mom or your friend or whomever that's working for you and they aren't covered under liquor liability. So if you're doing it, and they're just contractors and something bad goes wrong, you're covered because you have liquor liability insurance, but then your mom or your friend isn't, right? Like if that's a business risk that you're willing to take, then cool, then yeah, I mean, you can do contractors. Um, but for me, knowing what I know now, which is why I'm teaching you guys what I've learned over the years, I would have always done W-2s because I want to mi minimize the amount of risk that my bar and that my staff um, is exposed to. So I, and even if it's family, I would W2 them. We don't have any more questions, but I wanted to share a personal experience that I had. So I had COVID the last quarter of the year. I also had 10 weddings on the book at the time that I was hospitalized. Had I not taken the provision and time to train my team, train leads, it could have been horrible. My team was able to crank out all of these events. We got just amazing feedback from our venue clients. The business never sleeps. Even when you can't be there, your business cannot sleep. So I really appreciated that, you know, I used that downtime during the early wave of COVID to get everyone trained out to identify those leaders, as Sarah mentioned. Uh, that's so important because you cannot be everywhere. I did not have to call once. The venues called me just giving rave reviews. Hey, Andrea, we're no, we know you're not here, but the leads and the people that you sent were amazing. They did an amazing job. We're looking forward to working with you in coming years. As a, as a, as a operator, like that really warmed my heart because those people really are a reflection and an extension of you. So remember that. Even if you're just starting out, I'm sure family members or friends, people want to be really anxious about supporting you. You have to do what's best for your business. Always be thinking about what's best for your business. You're taking on the liability. You're taking on the financial investment. It's you. So keep that in mind. Yes, I love that. And also, if people are trying to save money by hiring friends and family, um, that's not a great way to be because you need to be building that cost into your pricing anyways from the very beginning right assume that you will have to pay someone 
uh, a regular rate from the very beginning. And that way you, you can uh, hire for the, uh, the talent and the skill that you need, not just uh, get fa favors from friends and family. I, I did see a, a question real quick before I sign off asking about the profit first. I just think that's so hilarious. Rhonda's been trying to get me to do a class on profit first for like 18 months. And it's just, I don't know that we're, I might do a bonus one and drop it in the course, but it's really all I was going to teach you is what's in the book. So if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. It's uh, Profit First by Mike McCowie-Willowitz. I don't even know how to say his last name. Um, it's, it's literally saved my business from uh, going under, under COVID. Um, it, it, it sets your business up for success and a lot of people uh, wait too long to, to do it. Um, and some people uh, never do it, but I think it is the single most um, uh, imp important financial thing that you can do as a business owner is, is kind of follow that profit first uh, modality. So I might do a quick little course on it, but it really is all there right in the book. So you don't need me for that, which is why that was the one that was going to go um, because we did want to get that uh, the garnish class in there. Yeah, Marty says yes. One final, one final question populated in the chat and then we'll transition to exit and prepare for tomorrow. Yeah. If an owner works a shift, do you split tips with your team? Yeah, so if I'm, a, if I'm acting as a bartender, then uh, maybe. Uh, it really depends. In my early days, I struggled with this because I was really like, I quit my job and it was like make or break and I wasn't, I wasn't pricing myself, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna out myself. I wasn't pricing myself enough so that as the owner, I was making enough money on each event. And so I felt like I needed to take some tips and work events in order for me to make a, a profitable go at this. Um, but then as I started to price myself better, I'm like, oh, I'm already making 800 bucks on this event. Do I really need the $40 cut from tips? No, I want my bartenders to have that. Even if I work the shift, because I'm working the shift and I'm getting the 800 bucks. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I don't feel the need to take the tips any longer. Um, but if you are still at that place where you, and, and I've done this, I, I think I actually have this in one of the videos for the, for the course up here. Um, I've worked with uh, mobile bar companies who've been in business for three, four years and we'll start coaching. And one of the first things I do is a financial analysis on their uh, pricing and their events. And at the end of it, it's like, oh, you make less than $200 on every event. Yeah, you, you probably do need those tips. But if you're pricing yourself uh, the way that you should be, then um, you won't really need it. So it's really up to you as to whether or not you feel like you deserve it or should have it. Technically, you, I think you can take the tips because you worked a shift, um, but it's really, it's really up to you. All right. Well, thank you all again so much for attending day one. Our fearless leaders, Sarah, thank you so much for presenting your information on staffing. Rhonda, so much. Uh, bitters and syrups, uh, our social media guru, Monica Van Landingham. We're going to see everyone back tomorrow at 10 a.m. for more education. Please don't forget to hashtag SwickCultureTN. Make sure you hashtag Mobile Bar Bootcamp. Follow us on social media. Make sure that you're sharing your info. If you're excited about today, make sure that you're putting that out. We're going to have a parting song and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Eat my chocolate. Rhonda's already out. She's like, bye, bitches. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get this closed out. Oh, Claudia, thank you. Thank you. I can't wait for tomorrow either. This is the most that you guys are going to see of us. Everybody, every other day, it's uh, we're just kind of the support group. Yeah, I think we crushed it. It was awesome. So good.